Tories' gifts given to the president while in office. There's currently a bill that would change how the gifts are administered. You'll hear testimony from White House officials involved in the process and some others. Congressman Steve Horn of California chaired the two-hour and five-minute hearing. being present, the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and Intergovernmental Relations will come to order. Today, the Subcommittee will consider a bill drafted by our colleague, Mr. Osi from California. The bill is H.R. 1081, the Accountability for Presidential Gifts Act. As its name implies, the purpose of this bill is to improve accountability over the thousands of gifts that are given to the president, to the executive residence at the White House, or a presidential archival depository. Currently, six different government agencies have a hand in recording and managing presidential gifts. That multiplicity of duties involving these gifts can lead to confusion and create unwarranted problems. Indeed, an investigation conducted by Mr. Osi's subcommittee on energy policy, natural resources, and regulatory affairs found very serious problems involving the presidential gifts during the Clinton administration. The problems that Mr. Osi's subcommittee identified affected virtually every aspect of gift administration, including tracking and reporting on gifts, establishing their value, determining whether they were intended as personal gifts or as gifts to the United States, and ensuring their proper disposition. H.R. 1081 would require the National Archives and Records Administration to maintain a comprehensive inventory of all presidential gifts from sources other than foreign governments. All information in the inventory would be subject to public disclosure. Mr. Osi will describe the flaws in the existing systems and how his bill will correct them. Administration officials and others believe that legislation is not needed at this time. They maintain that the current administration has already changed the process to address the problems of the past. In addition, they raise concerns about whether the National Archives should be responsible for administering an inventory of presidential gifts. Our witnesses today will present a full range of views on H.R. 1081. I welcome each of you, and I look forward uh, to your testimony. And uh, Mr. Osi, Thank you, Mr. the Chairman. author, and uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a lengthy statement. I would beg the Chairman's uh, Take your time. The uh, ranking Dolphins. member's not here, and she also would like to speak on this. Right. So, Mr. Chairman, as always, you have convened a hearing that is important to our ability as a country to govern. The American people have a right to know what gifts were received and retained by their president. Donors, should donors of those gifts should receive no unfair advantage in the policymaking process or other governmental benefits by virtue of that gift. Several laws involving six federal offices and agencies govern the current system for the receipt, valuation, and disposition of presidential gifts. Unfortunately, no single agency or person is ultimately responsible for tracking presidential gifts. In early 2001, there were, there were press accounts of President Clinton's last financial disclosure report and furniture, furniture gifts returned by the Clintons to the White House residence. To prevent future such abuses, I drafted a bill and asked Mr. Waxman to become an original co-sponsor. At his suggestion, the Government Reform Subcommittee on Energy Policy, Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs, which I chair, spent 11 months gathering the empirical data to support this legislative effort. The subcommittee investigated how the current system works and what legislative changes, if any, 
were needed to prevent future abuses of the presidential gifts process. In March 2001, I introduced H.R. 1081, the Accountability for Presidential Gifts Act. This bill establishes responsibility in one agency for the receipt, valuation, and disposition of presidential gifts. On February 12th of this year, my subcommittee held a hearing to present the results of its one-year investigation and to receive comments on the bill. At the hearing, I released a 55-page document summarizing the subcommittee's findings. Mr. Chairman, I ask that you include my February 12th opening statement and that particular document in today's hearing record. Without objection, it's so ordered. Today, I would like to summarize the following, how the current system works, my subcommittee's investigation and findings and recommendations made in my sub subcommittee's hearing. Here's how the current system works. The White House, gift, you're gonna have to pay attention because it's complicated. The White House Gifts Unit is responsible for recording all domestic and foreign gifts received by the first family, including the valuation and disposition of gifts. Under the Presidential, Re Presidential Records Act of 1978, the National Archives and Records Administration, which we're gonna refer to as NARA from now on, accepts gifts for presidential libraries and stores presidential gifts that are not immediately retained by the president, but which can be recalled for possible retention by the president. Under a second law, the Department of Interior's National Park Service annually makes a snapshot inventory of public property in or belonging to the White House residents. In addition, the National Park Service officially accepts gifts for the White House residents. Under a third law, the Office of Protocol in the Department of State annually publishes a listing of all gifts, both tangible and monetary, from a foreign government to a federal employee, including to the first family. Under a fourth law, the Office of Government Ethics receives annual financial disclosure reports from the president for gifts retained over a reporting threshold. That threshold is currently set at $260 in value from any source other than a relative. Lastly, the General Services Administration has staff assigned to the White House Gifts Unit and is responsible for updating the reporting threshold for gifts and for disposing of some gifts which are not retained by the President or sent to the NARA. General Service Administration's regulations require a commercial appraisal for foreign gifts over a reporting threshold, that is a certain value, that a federal employee, including the President, wishes to retain. In contrast, there is no statutory requirement for a commercial appraisal for domestic gifts over reporting threshold. So you see one difference there between foreign versus domestic. In its investigation, my subcommittee examined National Park Service's annual inventory and other records for the White House residents, the financial disclosure reports still in the Office of Government Ethics files, NARA's database for the former administration, and the White House Gifts Unit's database for the former administration. The investigation revealed startling information about retained gifts, valuation of gifts, missing gifts, legal rulings about gifts, and other findings. The White House gift system had 94,178 gift records, many of which had more than one item on them, to the former first family during the two-term presidency that they served. The former first family retained one or more gifts in 16% of these gift records. That would be 14,770 such records. The former president disclosed on his annual financial statements less than 2% of these retained gifts. Of those, to just to be exact, Mr. Chairman, of the 14,770 that were retained, 227 of them were disclosed on the annual financial statement. And each of those 227 were valued at $260 or more. These 227 gifts that were disclosed had a total valuation of $361,968. That's according to the disclosure form. An additional 26 retained gifts of $260 or more were not disclosed on these annual financial statements. The former first family was not required to disclose an additional 98 retained gifts, which were each valued just below the threshold. That would be in the $240 to $259 range. These 98 gifts totaled just over $24,000 in value. 49% of these gifts, of these 98, were never appraised or otherwise independently valued. 
a subcommittee that found that 69% of certain fair trade gifts, that is brand name goods widely sold, were undervalued. Chart 3C is right over here includes examples of non-fair trade items which were probably undervalued, such as various collector's items. Some gifts were misplaced or lost. Let me repeat that. Some gifts were misplaced or lost. For example, a 7 foot 3 inch by 6 foot 2 inch Oriental rug, valued on the disclosure form at $1,200, and an inscribed Tiffany silver box, valued at $271, were both, quote, on loan in the residence, end quote, but later, quote, misplaced by staff member never conveyed to the president, end quote. I think we have a gift record on display over there to quantify that. The White House counsel made some unusual rulings relating to gifts, which frankly were oddly reflected in the treatment of the gifts. For example, in the year 2000, counsel advised, quote, it would be a bad idea to accept, end quote, 10 shares of GE stock, and as a result, the gift was returned to the sender. However, in 1997, there was a gift of 15 shares of Coca-Cola stock valued at $1,027 that the first family chose to retain. The Office of Government Ethics rules state, a state that a federal employment shall not solicit a gift, and I can cite you, Mr. Chairman, uh, actual place where it is, if you'd like. Nonetheless, in December 2000, after the former First Lady was elected a U.S. Senator, but before her term began and she would be subjected to the Senate's gift rules, the former First Lady received $38,617 in China and sterling silver gifts purchased from Borsheim's in Omaha, Nebraska. If you look over here at chart 1B, you'll see them listed. Unlike gifts from Tiffany's or Neiman Marcus or other fancy retailers, which only require the name of the intended, the intended gift recipient to see his or her gift registry, Borsheim's website says, quote, friends wish list. View a friends wish list. You will need their email address and wish list password, end quote. Now, I think we have three more charts over there on display just to give you some sense of that. What this means is, the donors who purchased these gifts from Borsheim's needed to know both the former First Lady's personal email address and personal password to access the registry and purchase items from her wish list. $94,365 in 45 furniture gifts are especially remarkable in their complexity. And we have another chart down here that goes through those. Usually, the chief usher for the executive residence decides if items should be accepted for the executive residence, and the National Park Service sends an official thank you letter as proof for the donor of his or her contribution to the federal government. However, in March of 1993, the deputy counsel to the president directed the chief usher, this is unbelievable, directed the chief usher that certain items already received by the White House and certain items not yet received were to be accepted by the National Park Service for the executive residence. So in effect, we were accepting gifts that hadn't yet been offered. It is illegal to remove U.S. government property. For instance, Mr. Chairman, you and I can't take our chairs home from where they sit behind our desks. After unfavorable press reports in February and March of 2001, the former First Family returned 25 furniture items to the National Park Service. However, in September of that year, National Park Service apparently returned two of these items back to the former first family, since neither had been officially accepted by the National Park Service to the White House residence. This points out a particular flaw in, the, in that we, re, we received them, and then for some reason or another, the National Park Service didn't get the acceptance done. So in effect, they legally remain the property of the first family. The question really then arises as to who got credit for giving them, but we'll get into that. In addition, four furniture gifts were never disclosed on the former president's annual financial disclosure reports since the White House Counsel's Office stated that they were, quote, accepted, end quote, prior to the inauguration, that would be of January of 93, even though they were not received in the White House until July 20th 
of 1993, six months after the inauguration. So here we, here we had a provision in the council saying you have to accept these gifts that haven't yet been offered, and then we have a second ruling saying that you have to accept gifts that haven't yet been received. No, you can't. Well, we'll get into that. It's confusing enough. Lastly, the former first family still have 21 more furniture items, none of which ever appeared in National Park Service's White House annual the old June's inventory. 19 of these items, valued at $38,328, were received on December 1, 2001. That is, after the former First Lady was elected a U.S. Senator, but before her term began. The recommendations in the February hearing were as followed, and were received from as follows, people, the individuals as follows. Scott Harshberger, who is President and CEO of Common Cause, Paul Light, the director of the Center for Public Service at the Brookings Institute. Gregory S. Walden, a former associate counsel in the White House Counsel's Office for President Bush, President Bush 41, and former ethics counsel for President-elect George W. Bush's transition. He's currently of counsel to Patton Boggs LLP, and the Honorable William H. Taft IV at the Department of State. All three witnesses on panel one, that is Mr. Harshbarger, Light, and Walden, in their written statements or in response to member questions, recommend that I refer this matter for criminal investigation by the Department of Justice. On February 13th, I sent the Attorney General evidence relating to the solicitation, receipt, failure to report, or conversion of, president, of presidential gifts by the former President and First Lady. One of the documents I forwarded was Mr. Walden's written statement. In a section captioned, quote, evidence of widespread or systemic failures should be investigated, end quote, he concluded that such evidence could form the basis for a Department of Justice investigation of possible violations of 18 U.S. Code subsection 1001 regarding false statements, 18 U.S. Code subsection 641 regarding conversion of federal property, and 5 CFR subsection 2635.202, parentheses C1, 2, and J, regarding solicitation of a gratuity. Additionally, witnesses recommended that H.R. 1081 be amended to, first, disclose all gifts received over a minimal threshold, cap the gifts that it, over a certain threshold, that accepting therefrom personalized honorific awards and gifts from relatives or foreign officials, prohibit acceptance of gifts during certain periods, and prohibit, the prohibit by statute the solicitation or coordination of gifts. After today's hearings, I intend to prepare amendments to my bill for consideration at future markup. In conclusion, the total value of gifts retained by the former First Family creates an appearance problem. The fact that so many gifts were undervalued raises many questions. The fact that gifts were, I mean, the fact that gifts were misplaced or lost shows at best sloppy management, maybe something more. The fact that U.S. government property, that is the taxpayer's property, was improperly taken is very troubling. And the fact that after the former First Lady's election to the U.S. Senate, before we, she was subject to the Congress's strict gift acceptance rules, she managed to schedule the acceptance of nearly $40,000 worth in furniture gifts and that she participated in what appears to be a solicitation for $40,000 in fine china and silver is disturbing at best. The fact of the matter is public servants, including the president, including the members of the first family, should not be able to enrich themselves with lavish gifts at any time whatsoever. Mr. Chairman, the current system is broken and needs to be fixed. I believe that H.R. 1081 is a necessary first step, and I commend it to the committee. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and now I'm delighted that uh, this morning we have Mrs. Maloney uh, in New York and a former uh, ranking member on this subcommittee, and we're glad to see her back. So we're glad to see you. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I, I really uh, want to go on record in thanking you for your leadership and dedication in protecting the public's interests. I, I regret that you have made a decision not to run for re-election, but you have provided uh, extraordinary leadership uh, in this Congress and campaign finance reform and 
protecting um, families, working families, and, and just being plain fair to the minority and, and to the, the, the people of America. But uh, today, uh, it's an important hearing, and we will hear from experts from the executive branch as well as representatives from good government, uh, watchdog organizations, on the effectiveness, or lack thereof, of the current uh, Presidential Gift Reporting Act. From the beginning, presidents and their families have received gifts. Uh, take uh, examples from the, the last uh, three presidents, and uh, just to mention some of the gifts that they received, according to press accounts, the Reagans were given a $2.5 million retirement home in Bel Air. President uh, George and Mrs. Barbara Bush were given a barbie barbecue pit for their, for their home, and uh, china and, and furniture was given to the Clintons. I am really not surprised by the generosity of American citizens. The first uh, family in many ways is loved and admired by millions of Americans and uh, really watched like goldfish in a bowl. Uh, today we'll review whether or not the first family have the right to accept gifts personally and do they have some rights to privacy? What do and when should gifts be accepted on behalf of the United States uh, government and the American people? What are the limits? Uh, what triggers a personal gift or a gift to the nation? I, I support uh, measures that add clarity to a confusing system. It is unfair to past presidents and the current occupant of the White House to require our nation's leader to comply with a system that is flawed and unclear. The Clintons had the White House ushers and curators office, offices review and approve everything they removed from, from, from office or, or removed from the White House. Yet we saw a torrent of, of bad press stories last year when they left the White House. I am uh, deeply interested in, in today's uh, testimony regarding Mr. Osi's bill. At this point, I, I don't uh, know whether uh, Mr. Osi's bill or Mrs. Mink's, Mink's bill is the correct uh, fix, if, if more aggressive oversight by Congress is the answer, or if internal changes or modifications by the White House or archivist's office will survive, suffice. I look uh, forward to hearing the testimony of today's witnesses. Again, a, a system is not, is not a functioning system if the first family follows the rules but still manages to be hurt by them. Bad policy not only impacts the president and first lady, but helps to undermine the confidence of the American people in our government. And I'd, I'd like to uh, just... Uh, respond to some of the allegations that Mr. Osi made in his 56-page report and in his opening comments. You know, he, he uh, alleged that the gifts uh, to the past president and first lady were undervalued, yet the White House gift unit of past administrations used certified appraisers, and the Clinton administration followed the same practice. Uh, the White House gift unit has for the Clintons and past administrations used donor or store information from which the item was purchased as a basis for gift valuation, where the cost of the item is available. No first family in recent times has been responsible for gift valuation. It's done by the House gift unit. So if it's undervalued, then the, the person or the organization that made the mistake is the House gift unit. The, the House gift unit has not needed to appraise items such as hats, T-shirts, coffee mugs, handkerchiefs, hairbrushes, or, or calendars, as they are obviously below the, the reporting threshold. And uh, one thing that was missing from the report, that despite the fact that the prior administration followed the rules that are in place, I'm not saying that the rules might need to be changed, but they followed the rules that were in, were in place, and... and uh, they still took the unprecedented step of paying back, according to press accounts, $86,000 for gifts in 2000, including uh, China and silver, for which they're really, under the present 
uh, gift guidelines that we're not obligated to, to pay. But I look forward to the testimony, and I uh, thank the, uh, the chairman for his uh, leadership on so many important issues in this Congress, and I wish you'd run for re-election, Mr. Chairman. We're going to miss you. You want to walk into the precinct? <laughs> See with the legislature and use your charm on them. Uh, Ms. Mink, she's the panel one, and we're delighted to have the distinguished member from Hawaii. And she has a bill here, and she, uh, we want to hear it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and members of the subcommittee. I uh, introduced. H.R. 4776 a few months ago, and that bill actually is the product of an earlier hearing that I was privileged to attend, in which this whole matter of uh, presidential gifts was uh, discussed and uh, a testimony taken with respect to the flaws in the current system and things that needed to be corrected. I'm not really here to oppose our colleague, Mr. Olsey's bill, but uh, to really uh, advocate that we could avoid all of this embarrassment to the White House in the future if uh, you would consider the bill which I propose, which would uh, literally um, make it impossible for the White House or the First Lady to accept any gift uh, that was uh, more valuable than $50, which is the current Senate rule. It seems to me that uh, <clears throat> if you uh, go through the process of trying to streamline the current system, you only create and aggravate the situation. So I've come to the conclusion that really the White House, the President, is such an uh, enormous uh, figure in our society and our form of government, and as uh, the world looks upon uh, the uh, greatest power and the greatest leader that the world has, uh, to trivialize the office by uh, having to discuss from time to time uh, flaws in uh, the gift recording procedure or how much a gift was valued or should they accept it or should they not. I think is an affront uh, to that high office. So it would seem to me much more appropriate that a White House uh, not uh, be permitted to accept any. That's not to say that gifts are banned, because I think it is in the nature of our free society to give gifts, uh, but uh, to follow the procedures uh, which we all abide by, and that uh, particularly in the Senate which limits the value. So if the value of a gift exceeds the $50 uh, limit, then it becomes the property of the United States. Uh, it can be recorded, it can be uh, chronicalized in some file or whatever, but the point is that the gifts that are more uh, of higher value than $50 ought to be immediately considered the property of the United States. Uh, it can be given to um, other uh, departments or other entities or organizations, but it should not be considered the private property of the occupant of the White House. And I think that if we could um, enact a bill like mine, we could certainly avoid in the future any of this uh, consternation over whether gifts um, of a, a certain nature ought to have been accepted in the first place. So I would hope that this committee, in uh, considering the bills that are pending before this committee, would look at uh, the rules that apply to everybody else in the federal government, federal employees, members of the House, members of the Senate. Um, I don't think that we ought to use the word gifts are banned, because that is against the nature of a loving, caring, appreciative society. So people can give whatever they want to give. Uh, but uh, once given, it should become the property of the United States if it is valued uh, in excess of um, $50. I think typically we see the statistics that uh, the White House receives over 15,000 gifts a year. It's an enormous number. I don't 
uh, want to say that there should be less giving, but I think that um, a um, pronouncement of policy that the gifts that exceed the value of $50 belong to the people of the United States for such disposition as the law may allow would certainly eliminate this contention after the end of uh, every presidency. So I would hope that uh, uh, this bill would be added to the uh, table for discussion. And I ask unanimous consent that my testimony be inserted in the record at this point. Thank you. That objection be in the record at this point. Thank you very much Thank for you. your presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, when we consider this for uh, a markup, we certainly will have a 776 before us. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. We will now go to the uh, uh, panel two, the archivist of the United States and uh, the uh, special assistant to the National Park Service, Department of the Interior, Mr. Smith, uh, the uh, President, Chief Executive Order of Common Cause, Scott Harshberger, and uh, Paul C. Light, the Director, Center for Public Service, the Brookings Institution. And we will conclude this uh, uh, panel, too, with Gregory S. Walden, uh, Esquire, Patton Boggs, LLP, and who is thoroughly knowledgeable in this under previous administrations. So, as you know, we do swear in witnesses. And raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Are there any assistants uh, back of you that uh, will be giving testimony, in which case we'll swear them in now so we don't have to be disruptive? Anybody in the archives? Not directly, but uh, I'm going to consult them on a question. No, that's okay. Just as long as you mouth it. <laughs> it might be his brain, John, but... <laughs> okay, we're delighted to have the archivist of the United States here, Mr. Honorable John W. Carlin. Okay, Governor, it's all yours. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Maloney, Mr. Osi, I am John Carlin, Archivist of the United States, and I certainly thank you for the opportunity to share the views of the National Archives and Records Administration on H.R. 1081, the Accountability for Presidential Gifts Act. Before proceeding, Mr. Chairman, I want to take a moment to thank you you personally for all the work that you have done over the years to serve scholarship and support the foundation of freedom that we preserve and serve every day from the National Archives. There are few in public service that understand our mission from the perspective of both the scholar and the public servant, and we would put you first in that category. We certainly wish you the best as you go to your other challenges and look forward uh, to your transition from being a custodian of our services to again being a customer of our services. As we're here today to discuss the presidential gift legislation, I'd like to just take a moment to reflect on the importance of the presidential gift collections. The gifts that are on deposit and display in the presidential libraries add to the public's understanding of the president and of the presidency. And they document in a way that, record, that records cannot the stages of a president's life the important policy decisions of his administration, various world and national events, and topics of historical or current interest. We approach the subject from the perspective of the agency that can attest to the ongoing worth and historical significance of these collections. As to H.R. 1081, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate that you share our view of the importance of the Archive's role in preserving the presidential gift collections and that Mr. Osi and his staff recognize the important mission carried out by the National Archives for the American people. Any archives has to consider first and foremost the accountability and authenticity of what it preserves and makes available for research. However, 
One way to protect that accountability and integrity is to argue against expansion of our mission into areas that are the proper purview of others, that we would argue are currently being handled in a proper and appropriate manner. Mr. Chairman, while we appreciate your concern with the importance of accountability in the gift process and your trust in our ability to carry it out, the National Archives and Records Administration feels that this legislation goes beyond what is necessary and that the improvements made in the current system have already corrected the deficiencies identified in the findings section of the bill. In fact, some of the improvements we have implemented in this system have come about due to Mr. Osi's attention to this matter and our agreement that incremental change was in order. It is the necessity for additional change with which I respectfully disagree. I'd like to outline our five principal concerns with the approach taken in the proposed legislation and submit for the record a summary of the current system that we administer in providing courtesy, gift, and record storage for the White House. First, H.R. 1081 would require the Archivist of the United States to staff or supervise functions wholly duplicative of those currently being performed. As the addendum explains in detail, inventories of presidential gifts are already maintained by the National Archives and the White House Gift Office, who both play a distinct and important role in the handling and disposition of presidential gifts. So we do not see a practical need for the additional inventory that the legislation contemplates. Moreover, there is a significant practical problem with the proposal that the archivist maintain a current inventory of all presidential gifts. While the National Archives maintains an inventory of gifts deposited by the White House with NARA for courtesy storage, the only way that the National Archives could ensure the accuracy of the required inventory of all presidential gifts would be to staff the entire chain of custody from receipt by the president to ultimate disposal. In other words, the archivist would be required to completely duplicate the functions of the current White House gift office and possibly both the National Park Service and GSA units as well, depending on one's interpretation of the legislation. This approach seems neither prudent nor practical and would constitute a significant intrusion on the White House's traditional role in managing the gift process for the president. Secondly, Section 2 of the proposed bill specifies that the Archivist of the United States must report to Congress each proposed disposition of a presidential gift with a value greater than $250. All this, although this may not be the legislative intent, as written, it appears to require the archivist to make a report to Congress before the president can personally accept any gift. This process would add layers of complexity to the current process and cause unnecessary confusion about which agent has custody of each gift before the disposition has been reported to Congress. Equally important, it would unnecessarily and inappropriately intrude on the President's traditional prerogatives. Thirdly, as currently drafted, H.R. 1081 does not address the existing framework of controlling statutes and regulations and the traditional necessary distinctions among personal gifts to the President, official gifts accepted by the President on behalf of the American people, and gifts received by the National Park Service for the permanent White House collection. This complex system of controlling laws while partially based on the appraised value of the gift or the intent of the donor, also recognizes that in many cases, it is the decision of the president that determines the route and final disposition of the gift. As a practical matter, the administration of such a system can only appropriately be managed in the executive office of the president and under the current delegations of authority. As well, the National Archives believes the procedures and management controls associated with our current responsibilities for White House gifts are sufficient and do not require legislative change. Over the last several years, NARA has undergone an independent Inspector General review of our gifts operation, updated and formalized written procedures for the National Archives Courtesy Storage Unit, added new staff professionals to ensure proper handling and preservation of gifts in our custody, and regularly reviewed our management controls. Finally, we would question whether the central accountability problem assumed in the legislation exists today. It has been our experience that the current administration is paying careful attention to management controls associated with such functions and that proper procedures are currently in place to mitigate risk of reoccurrence. Mr. Chairman, 
This administration shares your commitment to the importance of ensuring <clears throat> that adequate rules and procedures exist to manage and account for presidential gifts. Responsibility for that process must be and is shared under the current system by the White House, the National Archives, and the Office of Government Ethics, among others. For the reasons I've explained, we do not believe the H.R. 1081 is a necessary or appropriate means of furthering that goal. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit as an addendum to my testimony a summary of the procedures currently in place at NARA to administer the gifts in courtesy storage for the White House. And obviously, I'd be happy to respond to any questions at the appropriate time. Uh, without objection, that document will be in the record at this point. Thank you. And we now move ahead to uh, P. Daniel Smith, Special Assistant to the Director of the National Park Service, Department of the Interior. Mr. Smith, we're glad to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to submit my entire testimony for the record and summarize it. It's automatically in the minute I call on you. The, everything's put in right then. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear before your committee to present the views of the Department of the Interior on H.R. 1081. The Department does not believe that the provisions in this bill pertaining to the National Park Service are necessary at this time. Existing authorities provide adequate processes for the National Park Service to accept donations for the White House and to maintain an annual inventory. The National Park Service accepts donations for the White House pursuant to two different legal authorities. The first authority allows the director of the National Park Service, when authorized and directed by the White House chief usher or curator, to accept donations of works of art, furnishings, and historic materials for the executive residence of the White House to become the property of the United States government. The director of the National Park Service has held this responsibility since 1933 under executive order and this responsibility to accept donations for the White House on behalf of the United States was further authorized by Congress on June 25, 1948, under USC Title III, Section 110, whereby the Director of the National Park Service was authorized and directed, with approval of the President, to accept donations of works of art, furnishings, and historical materials for use in the White House. Section 109 of this same act also directed the Director of the National Park Service to complete an annual inventory to be submitted to the President for approval. Since 1948, the National Park Service has accepted donations and performs its responsibilities in accordance with this legislation. The National Park Service accepts gifts only on behalf of the United States for use in the executive residence of the White House and does not accept gifts that are donated personally to the President. This is the responsibility of the White House Gift Office. National Park Service staff has worked closely with the White House Chief Usher and Curator on procedures for accepting donations for the White House and for inventorying this property. When the National Park Service receives a request from the White House Curator for museum-related donations or the Chief Usher for non-museum property donations, to accept a donation for the executive residence at the White House, the Park Service sends an official letter to the donor acknowledging and accepting this donation to the White House on behalf of the United States government to become government property. The curator and chief usher receive copies of the official letter of acceptance sent to the donor. In addition, for donations to the White House Museum collection, the chair of the Committee for the Preservation of the White House, a position held by the Director of the National Park Service, sends a Committee for the Preservation of the White House Certificate of Appreciation to the donor. The staff at the White House Curator's Office enters the information for donated items into the White House Museum and Inventory System. The National Park Service and the Office of Curator Staff physically inventory all items donated to the White House Museum Collection and other property donated to the executive residence at the White House during the annual inventory process as required by U.S. Code Title III, Section 109. That process is 
beginning this month at the White House. As a result of concerns raised last year, the Office of the Curator at the White House took the lead on reviewing the donation procedures and did so in consultation with the National Park Service. This review resulted in detailed specific written procedures pertaining to what actions are required beginning with when a donation is offered to the chief usher or the curator until it is accepted by the National Park Service and becomes property of the United States government, either as part of the White House Museum collection or as property of the executive residence at the White House. Under the revised donation procedures developed by the Office of the Curator, the National Park Service now receives copies of the documentation for museum-related donations and for non-museum property donations. That documentation now includes a letter of intent from the donor and a copy of, quote, acknowledgment of donation, unquote, form issued by the curator or chief usher. The documentation is used to prepare the National Park Service letters of acceptance. The National Park Service acceptance letter to donor makes it explicitly clear that the National Park Service accepts the donation to become the property of the United States. A second manner in which the National Park Service may receive donations for the benefit of the White House is through the National Park Service's General Donation Authority, which is found in USC Title 16, Section 6. In summary, the well-established system for, for the National Park Service to receive donations to the executive residence of the White House provide ample safeguards to assure proper accountability for these donations. The department also shares the concerns by the National Archives and Records Administration and the Office of Government Ethics that various features of the proposed legislation are wholly duplicative of current functions required under statutes and unnecessary to ensure sufficient and appropriate oversight of the, diff the gift donation process. Mr. Chairman, this completes my prepared statement. I look forward to answering any questions you or the committee members may have. I thank you. And uh, our next uh, presenter is Scott Harshberger, President, Chief Executive Order of, uh, Officer of Common Cause. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Ms. Baloney, uh, Member Osi, um, I would like to join with everyone here in uh, thanking you, Mr. Chairman, for your exceptional service. Uh, it's with great regret that we see you go, particularly since you have been uh, a leader on the major reform issues uh, before my time at Common Cause and continued to, uh, particularly into this last spring, late winter and spring, and we are very grateful to you uh, for that. Uh, we are here today uh, because Common Cause has been uh, focused uh, on issues of ethics and public life uh, since its creation and has been in many respects a national leader as an advocate on these issues. Uh, in pushing for the highest ethical standards for public officials, we understand that the vast majority of public officials are honest, upstanding, decent individuals. Ethical rules, however, have been put in place uh, to help illustrate and prove to the public that this is so, even though that is a hard sell to the elected officials. And having come from that world, I understand that. But the goal is to eliminate the appearance and suspicion of corruption. The reality is today we ought to recognize that had our private sector counterparts had similar rules that might have been as strict rigid, perhaps even uneven or viewed as unfair, we may not have had some of the major breakdown in corporate and other ethics that we have seen in Enron, Anderson, Global Crossing, and a whole range of other issues that now have tested investor confidence in the marketplace. So the common cause comes to this with the view that this is an issue that is very similar to the other appearance of conflict of interest or ethical issues, not simply as a question of accounting or as a question of whether who is the best way to record this, because the most important issue here is what is the gift? Is the gift to the President as President of the United States, or is it a personal gift? And it's that personal gift arena that brought us here last February in noting that 
We spoke at the presidential gifts as part of the ethical cloud looming over Washington in which special interests are able to wield power in the policy-making process by purchasing influence, access, and ultimately policy itself, or certainly the public could have perceived that. It is also obviously now clear that times of transition among administrations tend to lead to breakdowns of even the best of self-regulatory processes as these transitions occur. It was, after all, the transitional period uh, and what the president would do as he left office that caused the difficulty or certainly the perceptions of difficulty by the American people in terms of the conduct of President Clinton and then Senator Clinton uh, in this issue. And that's true in almost every presidential uh, transition. So that as we look at this, we see that this is an opportunity to take one more step, not as important as the gigantic step that we took toward cleaning up politics with the passage of the Bi Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act of 2002, which President Bush signed into law in March. That was a very important step, even though just a small step in moving forward. And we thank you and the members here and Congressman Osi as well for his support of that. Uh, taking action to prevent special interests from using gifts to buy influence and access and ultimately policy would be a strong complement to that. In terms of the actual inventory of issues, it does seem that fixing it in one place makes sense, much in the same sense that while everybody may have done their job well, we had a major election problem in the year 2000 because we didn't have just one election or even 50 elections. We had 13,000 different elections and somehow individual problems tended to create a constitutional crisis. In many respects, that same issue is posed here. It is not a question of the professionalism and competence of each of the agencies involved. It is, in fact, the reality that there are five or six or seven different agencies involved in this that poses the potential for the problem uh, to exist. And therefore, whatever else we do as we look at this, we ought to think about centralizing it. And we had a couple suggestions that we made about how, as you look simply as an inventorying process, you might want to make clear that the type of description and, and the identity of donors and what exactly the intent was, but other people have, th have talked about that a bit. It does seem, however, the best and the easiest way to approach this is to go further, however, and that is actually to adopt the position that Congressman Mink just stated. In fact, that's been our view, that the simplest and most logical way to enact new clear gift rules for the president is to apply the congressional gift ban to the president and vice president. And that's not a ban. It simply is a limit, a very specific limit. That would be the solution. That would cure all kinds of bureaucratic or possible misinterpretations by different White House counsels or the use of discretion. And the reality would be we would see if, in fact, the American people are giving or whether, in fact, once in a while, people actually give more because they're trying to gain some sort of insider access as opposed to giving to the president. Well, the reality is that using the congressional gift ban uh, would eliminate almost every one of those problems, $50 in any one gift and no more than $100 from any source in the calendar year. All the rest would go to the people of the United States in some format. That would eliminate some of the greatest problems of distinguishing between gifts of state and personal items. It seems that we cannot ignore that if you are expected to adhere by your conduct to set examples and represent the highest ideals of public service, surely the President of the United States needs to lead by example and be subject to the highest standards of ethical conduct. It's in fact because their office is so powerful and because it's so important that the public has an interest in preventing personal gifts that are corrupting or at least create an appearance of corruption or to have any doubt about why somebody is giving a gift. It might be interesting to see if, in fact, these gifts couldn't be given, whether as many different people would give them as do now. But that's another issue. The reform is essential to eliminate different standards that White House counsels may apply, to standards that different agencies apply. It also is important, we think, to have a law requiring more disclosure, not just upon request. These should be regular filings, much the same way that now campaign finance reports are made on a regular basis, simply a quarterly basis. They're out there. 
No need for people to request them. It's very important. In conclusion, the presidential gifts create an appearance, can create an appearance of corruption that's harmful to the public's confidence in the presidency, public officials, and government in general. Even if the act of taking a gift does not corrupt the public officials' judgment, the appearance of corruption undermines citizens' faith in their leaders and their government. Both the Clinton and Bush administrations accepted vast amounts of gifts, which have been detailed. But while the intentions of H.R. 1081 are good, and we commend it, it needs to do more. Reforming the process to, to rid it of the gift-produced corruption can and should happen, and we urge you to take that additional step, not just centralizing and having uniform standards, but also limiting and applying the congressional gift ban at a minimum to the President of the United States for all the reasons and because it is the presidency of the United States, not somebody's individual office from which they in any way should or appropriately can or could uh, receive personal inurement. To some extent in this day and age, maybe that comes later after the person leaves the presidency. We, uh, we thank you for that uh, presentation. And uh, we now go with Dr. Light of the Brookings Institution and a uh, person who we've had on many uh, 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 bits of uh, good government. And uh, he comes here in his good government role. So uh, Dr. Light, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think we're on. Um, uh, especially before this subcommittee, I, I totaled up that roughly two thirds of my testimony before Congress has appeared before this subcommittee, and and I think that you should take care of your former witnesses as you move on. Uh, kind of have us transferred to another subcommittee someplace that'll keep us active. Uh, it has always been a joy to testify before you, uh, Mrs. Maloney. Um, uh, this has been a wonderful committee, uh, subcommittee to work with. Uh, the subcommittee has done tremendously important work over the last uh, uh, years. Uh, your work on Y2K, on the Government Performance and Results Act, on the Office of Inspector General, your authorship of the uh, Presidential Transitions Act uh, with its orientation program for presidential appointees. I mean, the, the, the list of legislation where this subcommittee and the chairman have made a difference in improving government performance is profound and we're going to miss you. Not everybody can tolerate the scintillating, uh, exciting subject matter uh, that this subcommittee has dealt with uh, low these many years. Um, so now I appear uh, to talk a little bit about uh, presidential gifts and also to urge the chairman to climb one last hill before he leaves, and it's a big one. Um, the need for action on presidential gifts, I think, is absolutely clear. Uh, our reading of the public opinion data on trust and government suggests that there is no such thing in the public's mind as a presidential gift. That the American public believes that every gift is given for a reason, and the reason is to curry influence with the president. Doesn't matter how well the National Archives uh, does or the Park Service does, the public believes unfortunately, that the gifts given to the President or given to the Park Service or inventoried by NARA are not gifts out of the goodness of the American public's heart, but are out of the desire for influence. The question before us today, I think, is not whether uh, legislation is called for, but what kind of legislation ought to be enacted. Uh, the White House is working hard, I think, to improve the process. But White House reform is temporary, and I think my colleague from Common Cause makes the point well that it is the final three or four months of an administration uh, in which the gift-giving flood occurs and in which the breakdowns of accountability are most apparent. Legislation not only clarifies accountability, it creates an integrated system. Uh, it is the coin of the realm for reassuring the public that something is being done, just as we've now learned that we may need to bring together the Homeland Security agencies into a coordinated whole. Frankly, I think we can do the same for presidential gifts at a much lower level of uh, legislative detail. 
We must cure the appearance problem. There is continued confusion over who is responsible for gifts, and much as I feel uh, that the White House is right to be concerned about the insult embedded in such legislation, this is not about the Bush administration. It's not about the Clinton administration. It's about the public's confidence in government. Can technology be part of the answer? Absolutely. I think my colleague to my left uh, will talk a little bit about technology, uh, unified databases in which we can monitor and keep track of, of uh, gifts, I think, are right in, in the right direction. Three months ago, when I testified before uh, Mr. Osi, um, I argued that we should not have a ban on gifts to the president. Um, in thinking and listening uh, to the testimony of my colleagues from the administration, uh, I'm starting to wonder whether or not we ought to do it. Um, if the Park Service is comfortable that they are doing the best they can, if the Archives is comfortable that it is doing the best it can, and I'm not uh, to dispute them, uh, then something must be done to restore confidence at the very center of the gift-giving process, which is in the White House. And it may well be that we have reached the moment in time where we must put the same limits on gifts to the President that we have on gifts to senators and uh, other legislators. Let me just talk briefly uh, about uh, the tenuous connection between presidential gift giving and a pay increase for executive, legislative, and judicial uh, officers. Um, I titled my uh, testimony here, uh, Deliver Them Not Into Temptation, uh, because I think it's time for us to consider the very real and serious pay gap that we have created at the very top of our executive, legislative, and judicial salary structure. Uh, we are now at a point where the pay structure encourages a future in which only three types of individuals will likely seek office. Uh, the very wealthy, who have nothing to lose, the hyperzealous, uh, whose low pay is uh, proof positive of their commitment to the cause, and the easily corruptible. Um, I believe that just as this subcommittee led the charge two years ago to double the president's salary, it was a tough issue to take on. It was a difficult issue to sell. Uh, I got more hate mail uh, because of my testimony before you at that uh, hearing uh, than I have received on any other testimony I've given. Um, but it is time to consider uh, the uh, issue of raising legislative, judicial, and executive salaries again. We doubled the president's salary, thereby increasing the distance between members of Congress, judges, and senior executives and the president. Um, ironically, uh, we've done nothing to alter the pay or the gift-giving system so that presidents not only receive a doubling in salary, uh, they face no limits on the gifts they can receive. It's a wonderful opportunity. Um, uh, and I would encourage the, uh, the chairman uh, in his final months in office here uh, to consider the possibility that we ought to remedy uh, the implied imbalance of power that we created by doubling the president's salary without addressing executive, legislative, and judicial salaries. I suspect I'll get plenty of hate mail on this. Our polling data, which I've attached to my testimony, suggests that uh, the only thing the public dislikes more than a presidential pay increase is a congressional pay increase. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there is no way to write a public opinion question under which we could create public support or implied public support for congressional pay increases. No matter how we wrote the question, Roughly 54% of the American public is strongly opposed to a pay increase for members of Congress. Uh, there are slightly higher support for a pay increase for Supreme Court justices and, by implication, uh, members of the federal judiciary. Um, it's a tall hill to climb, but I think it's one well worth climbing. I don't know what legislation you can attach it to. Um, I don't know how you're going to do it. Uh, I don't know when you're going to do it, but you've only got four or five months left of legislative time in which to try. Uh, you have my strongest support for doing so. Uh, I will testify uh, to this effect should you bring forward legislation. Probably one of my last times to testify 
uh, in coming years. Um, let me conclude by uh, again noting what a pleasure it's been uh, to be a witness before you. It, 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 it's a delight to be playful and to be encouraged to be playful, but we're all serious at the end of the uh, conversation. I'm congratulating for you for your time uh, here on Capitol Hill. You may remember, and I hope you do, that at an earlier point in career, you spent some time at Brookings. Uh, should you decide that you'd like to have another tour of duty at that fine and distinguished think tank, at 1775 Massachusetts Avenue. I'm sure that we can arrange it. Thank you very much. Well, I thank the gentleman. And uh, uh, is that a gift? <laughs> um, you'd have to raise your own money, I'm afraid. So uh, I know, I know that. Uh, that we pay less. <laughs> well, now the gentleman we have last as a presenter here has been before this committee and done a wonderful job and is probably Mr. Ethics and uh, Mr. Attorney for numerous uh, administrations, and it's Gregory S. Walden of Council, Batten Boggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this morning, I'll briefly touch on the problems with the current presidential gift system that require correction. Outline the reforms, I believe, would materially improve the system and explain why I think those reforms can be obtained and achieved administratively and not, legislat not legislatively. H.R. 1081 correctly identifies the two major problems of the current system, lack of accountability and confusion as to the status of some gifts. The, bin the bill pins the lack of accountability on the fact that several agencies play a role in the system. Now, it's true that gift review, acceptance, reporting, and disposition authorities are spread among the White House, the GSA, OGE, the Archives, State Department, and the Park Service. But I don't believe it's the multiplicity of agencies that's the root of the accountability problems. Rather, I see it as a lack of transparency and a lack of external compliance controls. And I think the problems in the past were not the Park Service's problems, not the Archives' problems, not the GSA's problems, not the State Department's problems, they were the White House office problems. Under current law, many gifts to the president are not required to be reported publicly. And the review and approval process takes place largely outside of public view. But I don't think this is altogether a bad thing because of the privacy interests at stake when talking about gifts to the president and the first family. Now, Congress recognized those privacy interests when it set a reporting threshold and raise the reporting threshold to $250 to $260. That is the reporting threshold for financial disclosure reports for members of Congress and for executive branch agencies. But without this accountability that would come with transparency, you need something else. And it's compliance controls, I would call, review, auditing, and enforcement. They must assume greater importance. The Energy Policy Subcommittee's report in February showed four major failures in the gift system in the last administration. A failure to register gifts, a failure to report gifts that should have been reported on the financial disclosure report but were not, improper removal of gifts that had been accepted as government property, and improper solicitation of gifts. Now, there are laws currently on the books addressing gift reporting requirements, conversion of federal property, and restrictions on solicitation. But the legal compliance controls on the review, the acceptance, the reporting, and the disposition of gifts are inadequate. So any bill that seeks to improve the integrity of the gift system should address these problems. Concerning the failure to register gifts in the first place, I'm not certain, I'm not certain that assigning the responsibility to the National Archives or any other agency is the answer. Even if the archivist were to take over this responsibility, he would need to rely on the diligence and the compliance of the White House office staff, as the White House gift office does so now, unless you were to create a duplicate staff or additional, assign additional archive staff and put them inside the White House office. As effective and perhaps more so would be to adopt a set of written procedures to be followed by all White House staff to ensure that every gift given to the President and the First Lady is reported within a very short period of time and done so electronically. Now, it appears from reading the prepared statements of the archivist and the Park Service that the White House has put in place 
this White House has put in place uh, some of those procedures. Regarding valuation, how can we ensure that each gift is properly valued? Well, I do not doubt that every administration, every White House has had some sort of written procedures, but they didn't work last time. They didn't work. And so even if you have a set of written procedures showing how you go to an independent appraiser, you need some sort of outside review. I would suggest on a regular and random basis. But I wouldn't put that review outside of the executive office of the president. I'd keep it inside the White House office, inside the White House counsel, assign the White House counsel, or perhaps the office of administration to do that. Now, the advantage of having the White House counsel's office do this for audit function is to preserve the legitimate privacy interests of the president and the first family. And the White House counsel's office, I would submit, is in a better position to determine whether the donor of the gift or the circumstances of the gift raised an appearance problem such that the gift should be returned and declined. Also, when reviewing the financial disclosure report that is filed by the president, it is my experience, and I believe it's done so now, that the President's personal attorney and the White House Counsel's Office reviews the financial disclosure form in draft before it's submitted, and so that if any gifts appear on that form that would, have, that would raise the appearance question, they are rejected. I would submit that the White House Counsel's Office ought to review the entire White House gift database, assuming one is created or maintained or put in place, and that would, again, assure, should assure, that there's not improper valuation. As for the risk of improper removal of government property, conversion of government property, uh, I'm encouraged by the testimony of the Park Service that there seems to be an immediate labeling done of uh, property that is given to the President and accepted on behalf of the United States. This labeling should be done also as to gifts that have not yet been formally accepted by the President or personally or by the United States that are, on, that are on display in the White House for the duration of the presidency. 1081 would require the archivist to mean an inventory. I think this is a sound requirement. I would just suggest that the White House gift office database could be that inventory. And as for property that is accepted under the Park Service's authority, the Park Service database could be maintained. Perhaps we should explore how the Park Service database and the Archives database and the White House Gift Office database can be harmonized so as not necessarily to, to, uh, to um, uh, avoid any problems, but at the same time to preserve the privacy interests of the, the President. So as you can see, all of these actions, I believe, can be taken administratively. Some of them have already been taken based on the prepared testimony we've heard today. Undoubtedly, the gift system broke down in the last administration. Uh, I'm not, but I'm not resigned to the fact that we need legislation to prevent its recurrence. Uh, so at this time, I would say legislation is premature. We ought to give this White House and this executive branch an opportunity to disclose to this committee its written procedures and protocols and hope that that will be sufficient. Now, the bill would exempt from the required report to Congress gifts from relatives of the President, gifts under $250. But these gifts would still be recorded in the Archivist database, which information would be available to the public upon request. Now, I know other witnesses believe that these gifts ought to be disclosed to the public. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, when the gifts are accepted personally and they're under the threshold that Congress has set, uh, then there is not a corresponding public interest, uh, uh, countervailing public interest that trumps the President's privacy interests. Now, Congress can certainly exercise its oversight authority, which is, it did in February, and it's doing, uh, doing uh, today, and bring before it government officials to explain the protocols and procedures, and perhaps even to ensure that the, any audit done within the White House office is, uh, is done and performed properly. But regardless of whatever reform is enacted, whether by law or administratively, no statute or set of procedures will render a gift system impervious to simple error or even corruption. Because in the end, the integrity of any presidential gift system 
like any operating system which involves individuals, depends on competence, conscientiousness, and judgment of the officials who are entrusted with responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now start the questioning, and uh, we're going to do it five minutes apiece, and we'll keep uh, rolling around, and we'll share it between parties, and I'm going to start out on a few questions for the archivist of the United States. Uh, Governor Carlin, uh, can you give us an idea of what staffing and funds the archives would need to carry out the new responsibilities under H.R. 1081, uh, which uh, proposes to uh, what, uh, what do you think? Uh, have you done some uh, budget thinking on uh, what it would cost you in manpower, woman power, whatever? We have not uh, done any detailed uh, analysis from a budget point of view. Um, to do so, we would have to, with the committee, get a clearer understanding of intent so that uh, we would be producing a, a budget that would carry out what the uh, committee desired to actually have happen. It is clear it would take more resources. How much more would depend upon to what extent you would expect us to really duplicate what other existing agencies are now doing. Uh, for an example, as I mentioned in my testimony, if we are to report to Congress uh, every gift over $250, uh, at what part in the process should that take place? If it's at the front end, the very front end, we would have to be at the front end, and that would require staff. Uh, it would also require uh, resources, uh, uh, to do appraising that we do not do at this point. Um, obviously, with clarification on the exact implementation you'd want us to do, we could certainly produce a budget. Uh, it would require more. Uh, I don't think that's the issue, uh, pro or con. We would not argue against uh, the legislation because it would cost money. Uh, our points are as we stated in my testimony. How about the uh, interior? Uh, how much uh, space does you take up now in these uh, uh, various gifts that are given to the uh, presidency? Mr. Chairman, I don't know the square footage of that, but I do know that we do have off-site locations for that, and I can certainly provide that for the record. Well, I just wondered, uh, I'm not holding you to the inches, I'm just get a feeling. Do you have a room like this that uh, would take during a four-year administration, uh, and they all have these things uh, in this kind of space. Mr. Chairman, again, I don't know the details. It would be larger than that. It would actually be a, a museum type of quality space, and there are press reports of how they go back and forth and look for furniture, especially the first ladies do that. But So it's, it would be what you would expect to be uh, accredited type of storage space for that. So it would be quite a bit of square footage. I will provide that for the record. Uh, with, uh, without objection, that would be put in the record at this point. Uh, I'm interested in uh, particularly uh, the uh, uh, furniture and the uh, paintings which uh, people generously give to the White House, and uh, starting with Mrs. Kennedy and uh, the curators there. It would seem that uh, those uh, certainly isn't what uh, we want turned back. We want it to be part of the People's Museum when they go through the White House. Uh, do you have quite a bit of that uh, during the course of a year? As I understand it, there is, especially in the early stages of that, as, as, as the first family would look to see how they would like to set up the various rooms in the, in the uh, White House. But again, I'd like to assure the committee that where that storage space is located off-site, it is first class, fully accredited, uh, fire uh, controlled, uh, humidity controlled. Those collections are protected, as you would expect a gift to the White House and to the nation should be. Yeah, well, that's good to know. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, New York. And, uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome all of the um, all of the panelists. And thank you for all your hard work. Uh, 
and uh, particularly uh, Scott Har Harshbarger, and with whom I worked on what I consider one of the most important bills that has passed during my time here in Congress, campaign finance reform, and uh, your organization played a tremendous role in, in that for decades, literally decades. And when I came here as a freshman in 92, one of the first bills that I introduced along with my freshman class was the Congressional Gift Ban, which became uh, law. But I'm not as clear on uh, presidential gifts. I, I don't think I support a ban, uh, particularly for foreign gifts. I, I think some uh, nations would consider it rude if we uh, said we don't want to accept uh, their gift, and some of their presence have helped uh, create a better communication between our two countries. Uh, I would say that uh, the gift of the pandas uh, to our country was a, a wonderful uh, gesture that has uh, improved education and understanding of, uh, of our young people, more of China. I know my daughter has a map of where the pandas live, and she comes every year to see them at the, at the Washington Zoo. Uh, what, what exactly is the delineation between a gift to the president and a gift to the American people or the White House? What are the guidelines for that? Is every gift from a foreign nation a gift to the country? When is it a gift to the White House? And I would say that many of these gifts uh, end up in presidential libraries um, as part of their museums, and if they're not part of the White House itself. So is there guidelines when it is a presidential museum gift, a president gift, or a gift to the nation? Is every gift from a head of state a gift to the nation when they give to our president? What is the delineation? Does anyone know the exact delineation? Uh, yes, it's, uh, I think it's $260. If the value of the gift is over $260, it's automatically deemed property of the United States. This is under the Foreign Gift and Decorations Act uh, as implemented by the State Department uh, through regulations. If it's under $260, it can be accepted as a, mark, as a sign of courtesy if its rejection or declination would, would be an embarrassment uh, to the foreign relations of the United States. That's a paraphrase. Well, how is the delineation of what goes to a presidential library? Is everything over $260 belong to the White House? It cannot go to a presidential library? Or is there some consideration? Go to the archivist on that, or I'll, I'm going to continue. Those that are given. Uh, with the intent that they go to the White House collection, obviously, would the Park Service would take care of it. Yes, we have many, many uh, foreign gifts that end up in individual presidential libraries. In fact, I think the, the vast majority of foreign gifts uh, do end up in presidential libraries. So it's the intent of the giving country. They will say, I want this for the White House, or I want it for the presidential library. Who determines where this gift goes? I can't, uh, I think that's decided by the White House, but. Let me, let, I want to just stress with it, that you're in the middle of some very important distinctions here. Our point is that none of these gifts would be precluded at all. It would simply be that it is disclosed, who gave it, what was the, that's one whole level, disclosure. The second is, they would not be the personal property of the inhabitants of the office. That is, that is the diff distinction that we are seeking to make, which, which actually we believe to be the intent of the congressional gift ban. And perhaps it shouldn't be a gift ban call. It's a, it's a limit. It just simply says that over a certain amount, we're not going to have to do all this discussion about it. We're simply going to say this goes, this is no longer the property of the individual who inhabits. It may be of the White House, it may be of the Office of the Presidency, it may be these other distinctions that people who are can make, but I think that's the distinction we're trying to make, is that's where the people have the okay. problem. What, what, I, what the, I would like a, a clarification too, what about a personal gift? Say Mrs. Bush was my next door neighbor and I gave her a book of poetry that was worth uh, $300. Um, could she accept this book of poetry and read it every night if she so chose? And also, I know that many cultural institutions invite the first families to come to their openings or to their opera or ballet. Say the first family went to the Metropolitan Opera. Is that a gift? What if they go out to dinner with friends and the friend wants to pay for the dinner? Is that a gift that must be disclosed? 
could you could you clarify is there how are personal close personal friends say a college friend wanted to send the president uh, some books that he thought were inspiring. Uh, could he do that? I mean, could the president keep them, or do they have to go to a presidential library that he can't even look at them? And I'd like the archivist and, and uh, Mr. Smith uh, to, from the museum to answer first. Mm -hmm. Well, let me first uh, explore your uh, specific with the book for Mrs. Bush. Mm -hmm. If it was appraised at $300, first of all, she could accept it. I mean, if it was, the intent was that it would be a personal gift for her, uh, she could accept. And because it's above the limit uh, on an annual basis, it should be part of the report uh, that uh, goes in for the ethics and, and ultimately uh, whatever tax implement case implication that uh, might have. Uh, I would yield to my colleague, uh, Mr. Walden, on the specifics as far as when it gets down to the details of uh, what you're making reference to a night at the Kennedy uh, Center or at the Metropolitan Opera, because uh, we have a uh, no experience as an agency on receiving those kinds of gifts. Uh, well, right now, the President and the First Lady are not subject to any restriction on gifts, any statutory restriction on gifts. There's only a reporting obligation if the value of the gift is $260. Uh, the aggregate of gifts received from any one source in a per period of a year is $260 or more. Uh, the Office of Government Ethics regulations specify that for entertainment, you look at the ticket price. And if a night at the opera is $100 or $200, I've not been at the opera recently, I'm not sure if I'm in the ballpark there, uh, then if it's over $260, it would have to be reported on the financial disclosure report. And a gift to the First Lady that's independent of her relationship to the President, because perhaps you went to college with the First Lady, you give a gift to the First Lady, that does not have to be reported on the financial disclosure report. But if I gave it to the president, it would have to be. If it's over the uh, the two hundred sixty dollars. What about a dinner with their friends, their next door neighbors come to Washington? They want to take them out to dinner. Can they go out to dinner? I mean, are we getting yeah. so that that our first ladies and our presidents can't even talk to people because there's so many laws that say, I don't know. Anyway. What if what if one of your friends comes yeah. to town and wants to take you to dinner? Uh, we can't hear you. What if one of your friends comes to town and wants to take you to dinner? I don't go to dinner. I just work all the time. <laughs> no, seriously. I, if, you know, my husband thought that going to Washington was going to be fun. I mean, uh, he came up here two or three times, and I got out of the office past 12 o'clock. We're on the floor at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, I take them to dinner at the members' dining room. Yeah. That's what I do. We I, don't. But, but I'm, I'm just curious because uh, everybody, as, as, as Scott said earlier in his testimony, everybody wants to be honest. I certainly believe that uh, every president and first lady is of the highest uh, moral ethics. Uh, you, you would not get to that position without it. But do you, you want to make sure that the laws are clear so that you don't, uh, you know, you could go out to dinner with your college buddy and violate a law. I mean, yeah, I right. Know. But can, this is a problem that exists with the ethic law, ethics laws generally. I mean, uh, it, is, it is one you face, it's one every person here the faces to make mm -hmm. that distinction. We. It, it may well be, rightly or wrongly, part of the double standard that applies to being in public life. I made a little not facetious mm -hmm. remark that we might be better if people holding private positions of power adhered to some of these standards as well. But the other side of it is the reason we do, the reason we have tended to do, have tended to have these rules and limits is to, for clarity for purposes of clarity. But, but tied to that was the statement by Mr. Walden that you want to consider privacy. And if you could elaborate on that, if you have to disclose everyone you're having dinner with, everyone you're going out to see the Kennedy Center, uh, if you take your daughter, you're going to be, or your two daughters, you're going to be over the gift band. You're going to be over $200. Right. Or, right. So. So you have to disclose everything, you're, or every person you're talking to, every place you go, uh, everything that uh, your college buddy sends you, you know, 15 books he thinks are going to inspire you, please read them. You're going to have to disclose all of this. Now, who has access? You, you have no privacy on what you're reading, where you're going, who you're talking to. What, how is the privacy there when everything has to be disclosed? I, I, I refer to the attorney on the on the panel, Mr. Walden. How well, do you balance the privacy aspect? Well, Congress has set a threshold, a reporting threshold, and under that threshold, 
uh, gifts to the President and the First Lady are not reported, and they're not disclosed, even if there were a Freedom of Information Act request on the White House, because the White House is not subject to FOIA. The White House office is not subject to FOIA. So the privacy interests are respected by having a threshold of reporting at $260. Now, it used to be $100 uh, fairly recently, in the last uh, 10 or 12 years. So it's, it's set legislatively. And this Congress obviously has the authority to reduce or lower the reporting threshold. I would not advocate it, but to lower it, which would require more reporting. And But I think at the erosion of some uh, legitimate privacy interests of all federal employees. Thank you. I thank the time is up. woman. And uh, well, more than that. Uh, so uh, Mr. Osi will get 15 minutes on questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize at 12 or shortly thereafter, I am managing a bill from the larger committee on the floor, and I will have to depart, so I will move expeditiously. Okay. Uh, particularly interested in Mr. Harshbarger, Mr. Light, and Mr. Walden's answer to the question. Do you support Speak up a little because I can't uh, hear it. This is modern technology, so. <laughs> As of 1900, Do you, I'm particularly interested in uh, three witnesses on the right on the right hand side of the table. The question, answer to the question: Do you support disclosure of all gifts, or only gifts over a certain threshold? And depending on your answer as to whether or not there's a threshold, what threshold do you recommend, Mr. Harshberger? I think there should be a threshold. I think there should be. Um, you need, you need to keep in mind that I've got to leave in like 15 no, minutes. So I, yes okay. or no, yes no. Very quick. I think it should be. I mean, I think the key thing is to have an amount, whether it's fifty dollars, whether it's a, you know, hundred dollars. I mean, what, what that limit should be? There should be. It should be clear. And it's seen, the the position that we uh, have asserted here is that uh, I'd like to have a strong reason why it shouldn't be the same limits that apply to congressional. Okay. Uh, the to, House and Senate. Right. The House and Senate. Yes. Mr. Light. Um, I think there should be a uh, disclosure limit. I, sh I think it should be the same as for members of Congress. Mr. Walden? Uh, there should be a threshold uh, limit, and the President, as an elected official, should have the same uh, amount or threshold as members of Congress. Okay. Now, the, uh, Mr. Harshberger has recommended regular posting of gifts information on the Internet, which I think is a great advantage. Uh, I think, Governor, what is your reaction to that? I'm going to just go right. I know what Mr. Harshbarger's position is. I want to ask the other four. Do you believe we should have a regular posting on the Internet of gifts that have been received at the White House? It would be our position to implement the policy you pass. Uh, we've got enough challenges without uh, taking positions on what thresholds should be or not be. So you're not for or again posting, posting the information on the Internet? Obviously, as an agency, we're for access. Uh, but in terms of the specific policy that this would be different than our normal operating procedure, uh, we would yield to you. But okay. generally, yes, we're for access, for access to information. That's what Mr. we're all Smith. about. Park Congress would defer to archives on that. We do not deal with the personal gifts that you're talking about. Okay. Mr. Light, do you think we ought to post this information on the Internet? NARO's got one of the best sites uh, in the federal government, and this would only augment its um, uh, drawing power. Yes, I, I am in favor of it. What frequency do you recommend the posting? Daily, weekly, I, monthly, quarterly? I, I don't see. I mean, we have now the te we have the technology to do this almost instantaneously. And Mr. Walden, any observations? Uh, for foreign gifts, I would support putting them on um, the internet. Um, foreign gifts that are deemed property of the United States. For gifts accepted uh, for the library, gifts accepted. Uh, by the archives under its authority or gifts accepted by the Park Service, I would support a database. For personally accepted gifts, I would not. The financial disclosure report that everyone files, all public official files, is, must be destroyed after six years. And if, if the information is put on the net, then it's permanent. If, if uh, the policy on destroying financial disclosure reports is to be changed, then maybe I would revisit that. Well, I will tell you that well, that was one of the difficulties we had uh, in trying to quantify the, the extent of the problem, because we could not go back into records we no longer had. 
and it, it was a difficulty for us. And we've been attacked because we only had records for one administration, but I mean, that was the reality. Uh, Mr. Harsh, Mr. Harshbarger's got a lot of recommendations. And I'm, I mean, I'm going to, I know what your written testimony is, but I'm going to ask the others. I think these two gentlemen are going to say we'll follow the will, will of Congress and the, whether or not the president signs any bill. Mr. Light, what's your view of the need for the donor's occupation and employer? Uh, we require the um, occupation and employer of all transition team members, for example. It's uh, a very simple flag uh, to mark, and I don't see a problem with uh, including it. Certainly the employer uh, is sort of a, is a de minimis requirement, I would think. Okay, now that's not a piece of information that's currently required on these or collected under these gift forms. So right. you think it ought to be added? Yeah. It, it, okay. What we have across all of these laws for campaign disclosures, for transition participation, are a patchwork of different requirements uh, depending on what time of year you happen to be involved or what you're giving. Um, I think this subcommittee uh, could do everyone a favor by rationalizing the reporting requirements across the different kinds of things we give to our political uh, leaders. Mr. Walden, do you agree? Uh, on one's financial disclosure report, I think it would help to uh, know the uh, employer or the business uh, with which the uh, donor is affiliated. I also think it might assist the White House's job uh, to ask that any uh, gift be accompanied by donor identity so that the Council's office could adequately determine whether any gift would pose an appearance problem. Okay. Now, we've talked about the uh, maximum cap. And if I understand, Mr. Harshbarger and the two of you believe the standards for the executive branch should be the same as for the legislative branch. Whatever it is, it's X. Am I correct? On disclosure, yes. Yes. How about a, uh, do you support a cap on the, either the individual value of the gift or the aggregate value of the gift? If I understand your testimony, it is that you do support a cap of $50 on the individual gift and $100 in the aggregate. Is that correct? Wait. I don't think that, uh, no. Uh, it depends on who you're talking. Mr. Which, Harshbarger, is that your In terms of the individual gifts, our view was it would be exactly the same as the the congressional. Whatever the House and Senate whatever is. Whatever the House and Senate is. That's the individual. This is any right. other size gifts can be received. They can be received. They just become, they're just very clearly the property of, you so know, there's, the, there is no, the, I wanted, that's, this is the point I'm trying to get at. There's right. no prohibition on a gift being received. It's whether or not right. the individual can right. keep that. That's right. Okay. That's, a, that's, that's the limit that we're trying to. I think you were, you were trying, that's what we're trying to draw here as well, yeah. All right, let me go to a different subject then. There's a uh, question arose in the last administration as, as it relates to when gifts were received. There was a window after the election before a member of the first family was sworn into office. Uh, Mr. Light, your testimony indicated that you thought there might be merit in prohibiting gift taking during certain periods. Um, I want to talk, ask Mr. Harshbarger, Mr. Light, Mr. Walden whether or not they support including prohibited periods uh, within this legislation. Mr. Harshbarger? Yes. I mean, with it, when we talked about this before, I mean, it, first of all, it's likely to be a fairly rare circumstance. But on the other side, that, that, that the better course seemed to be very clearly to th there was that window that caused the problem for everybody's purposes. So I would think that there's reasonable to have a period in which uh, in that transition that you have limitations, or at least you have the limitations apply that are the same that apply to everybody else in those circumstances. So if you're a member-elect kind of thing, right. you'd be it subject to those. Should be, I would think that you should be subject to those precisely because you were a member-elect and, and, and that there shouldn't be a distinction between you at that point and, and then the office that you're, uh, that, okay. that you're about to hold. Mr. Light, do you agree with that? Um, you know, we cover everybody. Uh, in the transition coming into office with very clear uh, disclosure and bans on acceptance of gifts and so forth. Uh, you know, I wish it weren't true. I wish we weren't having this hearing. I wish you hadn't dug up all this data. I, I wish it wasn't out there. It's very tawdry. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fact is that we're at a moment now where we have to cure a problem uh, in the public's mind, and it's particularly serious. 
uh, in the last months of an administration. The appearance problems that came out of one single administration, I think, uh, have tainted public attitudes for future presidents, and we may have to do this as a matter of course, no matter uh, how difficult it is to us. So you would broaden it beyond just the member-elect issue? You'd, even if someone in the administration or the first family was not, you'd still have that blackout period? Yeah, I think you should have a blackout period. Mr. Walden? On the transition coming in, I would support uh, disclosure of gifts. I would not support a ban or a restriction on gifts. Uh, if uh, my colleague will uh, sure, no, permit me, I would, before you leave, what rules apply to gifts to the vice president and the spouse, and do they need to be changed? What do we do now in terms of the vice presidency? The vice president has the same exception that the president enjoys from the gift restrictions. So the vice president may accept any gift. Uh, that does not mean the vice president accepts all gifts. Uh, any gift can always be, be uh, declined. Same reporting requirements, $260 aggregate from one source in a reporting period must be disclosed. How about foreign gifts? It would seem to me he's got to spend a lot of time when the president is not in town and so forth. All foreign gifts, whether given to uh, a junior executive branch employee or the president or the vice president, fall under the Foreign Gift and Decorations Act. So if the value is $260 or more, it automatically becomes property of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Harshbarger, Mr. Light, Mr. Walden, do you support amending H.R. 1081 to include a legislative prohibition on solicitation or coordination of gifts to the first family? I, just to say, I did, didn't hear. Do you support a legislative, statutory, as opposed to regulatory, prohibition on solicitation or coordination of gifts to the first family? Right now, right now, it's a regulatory issue right. that says, well, you shouldn't do it. I'm asking you whether or not you think we ought to put that in statute. Wait, you know, strangely, when, from this discussion before, I don't disagree with Greg's position that it would be wonderful if we could assume, you know, the regulatory action and the actions of individuals would, would apply here. But I think when you, it is inevitable when you have a particular problem, uh, and if there, you know, that the legislation becomes one way in which you try to deal with it. Uh, I don't think that will solve every problem. Uh, we obviously have gone through this discussion on campaign finance reform. They're get, they're, people are going to think of other ways around, but just because, you know, the law doesn't solve every problem doesn't mean we don't pass it and try to do, we deal with a lot of crimes and conduct like this. So I think here you have an example of, of what uh, was, if it was a loophole, I agree with, with Mr. Light that, that this was a, a unique circumstance that highlighted a major problem uh, that clearly has assisted in undermining people's confidence. It is not a focus on Democrats or Republicans. It is, it is the issue, and I think that therefore a, a carefully crafted legislation that would address and, and remedy, at least fill these loopholes, would be helpful. Uh, and you know, I think if, when, if you had the limit already, and then you add that you can't do by if you can't do directly these kinds of things, you should be able to do them indirectly or through agents or through some other kind of okay, process. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> it's a long way around. Mr. Light. Yes, yes. Do you support a statutory prohibition? It, it, it depends. I mean, if you put a ban on uh, acceptance of gifts, um, you know, you're almost, it's redundant to say don't solicit uh, gifts that you can't take. But it depends on how the legislation goes. If you're not going to adopt uh, a variation of Representative Mink's uh, proposal along with yours, then I'd say yes, uh, ban uh, a coordinated solicitation. Although it's, it's distasteful that we have to say in statute that you shouldn't do the obviously unethical uh, thing. You know what I mean? Yes. Mr. Walden, any thoughts? I would not oppose codifying the ban on solicitation right. that's found in regulations, but I would uh, not favor putting it in Title 18, making it a criminal provision. As a general matter, and this is a much larger subject, I don't favor criminalizing uh, ethics rules. But codifying it as just as a civil statute, a uh, would, would, uh, I would not oppose. That's a good point. Okay. Now, the, uh, 
Mr. Light, your, your testimony states, quote, valuation should be of gifts, should be independent, consistent, and based on a clearly transparent methodology. And Mr. Walden states, if the no there are no written guidelines on how to conduct evaluation, including when it is necessary to obtain a commercial or independent appraisal, guidelines could be written after consultation with other appraisal experts. Then he adds that I concede that assigning the valuation process to an entity outside of the White House would ensure proper valuation. Mr. Harsberger, what's your view of the need for independent valuation or appraisals of non-minimally valued gifts, that is, those above or subject to the threshold question? Well, I mean, I respect very much uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Madden's position. And just as I do, I mean, I, I want to echo one thing. I, I think one of you do need to be careful about criminalizing this conduct, because I think that it tends to make it very hard as a prosecutor to prosecute these cases. Therefore, you tend not to do them. So civil violations can sometimes serve the same purpose. I, would, I just wanted to echo that. I think that we do a lot of that, making things that it makes it hard for lots of purposes, juries, for it is, How about on the valuation? No, now we're in, no, and this one, I would say it would be, I think White House counsel, we would be great if White House counsel performed these functions independently and autonomously. We now have enough examples, and, and, and I hate to go back to this because it dates me, the 30th anniversary of Watergate, we ought to, we have at a certain point the, 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 to rely upon the discretion of an official who holds his or her job by virtue of simply the, the ple pleasure of the person that they are charged with regulating. We ought to see and understand that even though they're supposed to be independent, they're supposed to be professionals first and foremost, we, have, we see it in the White House, but it's not just public service. We now see it in corporations all over this country. So you would Therefore, you would independent outside independent. audits at a certain, at, at regular points would be, I think, beneficial to the integrity of the professionals inside, would give them more ability to be independent and to be credible inside, because you knew the outside right. thing was there to validate. All right. Mr. Light, clearly I take your comment to be supportive of independent valuation. I, we'd probably want to steer clear of an auditing firm that starts with the letter A, but other than that, uh, yeah, we can figure that one out. All right, Mr. Walden? Uh, independent of the White House gift office, but inside the White House, I, I think OGE uh, and to some extent GAO could conduct some oversight as to the job the White House Counsel's Office is doing, but in the first instance, I would uh, entrust the responsibility to the White House Counsel. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to, uh, I have to go to the floor to manage this bill. I have a number of questions that remain. Uh, I can submit them for the record. Well, we can ask some of them. I would appreciate have. that. Uh, Fine. This is a very serious issue. I, I think the witnesses' comments that this is an unfortunate thing to have to discuss are accurate. That's the issue we're trying to deal with has no reference whatsoever to who or who may not be in this or that White House during this or that time. This is an issue about uh, giving the people of this country the opportunity to have faith that the decisions being made at the highest levels of government are not being inordinately influenced. Okay, let me uh, pursue some of these questions. Uh, Mr. Smith, Governor Carlin, uh, do you know what changes the White House Gifts Office has made to improve its controls? I cannot speak specifically to exactly what's gone on other than in our uh, workings with them uh, back and forth. It's clear they've made adjustments uh, and are operating in a way from where we can observe in a very appropriate way. By uh, law, Mr. Smith, the Park Service conducts a so-called snapshot inventory of all property belonging to the executive residence, including gifts, in the June of each year. Would it not be better for the Park Service to maintain a current and ongoing inventory of all gifts it accepts for the executive residence as it receives them? The the documentation as it receives it is coordinated with either the curator or the chief uh, usher. The annual count is to um, 
uh, actually inventory what's there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this includes such things as pieces of flatware and and uh, China and that type of thing. So it's a it's an ongoing count to to you know to account for what is on the record. Uh, do you know the, what changes in the White House Gifts Office has been made to improve its controls? Not in the Gifts Office, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, that deals with personal donations of the President. Uh, the changes that were made in coordination with the White House Curator's Office and the White House Chief Usher is that the documentation, the coordination of what either the Curator or the Chief Usher request the Park Service to accept, either for the museum collection or for the residents, is that there has a, been a very uh, key clarification made of the intent of the donor, meaning that it is going to be for the U.S. government, and that that is acknowledged back to the donor, and there's a better record-keeping process between the Park Service and the White House offices. Uh, moving ahead, uh, Mr. Harshberger, Mr. Light, unfortunately, many of the recent problems with presidential gifts apparently uh, stemmed from outright violations of existing statutory requirements and administrative controls. How will imposing additional requirements and controls solve those kinds of problems? I mean, I think the answer is that in enforcement, as, as has been mentioned, is, is key uh, to this. I mean, if you have no uh, credible uh, expectation or credible threat that rules or regulations or laws are going to be enforced, uh, then there, you know, the, the sanction value isn't there. I think there's a certain measure, I think, we've always believed to public disclosure and public scrutiny tends to add measures of uh, enforcement that, that, uh, that have a useful effect. Um, the, the reality here is, I think, that you've, you're, you're hoping uh, that by having some measures of independence uh, come into the process, that will facilitate it. Having some measures of public disclosure that don't now exist will help also serve as an antiseptic. Uh, but I think if you also look at the question of what the actual remedy is, if the remedy is to going to more this congressional gift ban limit restriction, I think that, in and of itself, uh, will uh, will have a significant benefit because then any violations will be much clearer. I mean, the very problem we have here is that what exactly is a violation and what isn't is so is almost so complicated. And once it becomes once that becomes very difficult, it's very hard to have credible and consistent enforcement. I mean, I think that the current system is such a mess in terms of allocating and making decisions and valuing uh, gifts that one could easily violate it without knowing. Um, I, I'm not willing to say that the mistakes made in the last few months of the uh, previous administration were deliberate or, or not. It's hard to tell. There appears on these charts to be a pattern of picking and choosing the gifts that uh, would fit best with uh, the President's future um, uh, property needs. Um, but the, the system is such a mess that uh, 1081 and other uh, efforts to kind of rationalize it should improve uh, performance right away just by making it clear exactly uh, where the lines are drawn. Is it uh, basically, uh, well, the archivist points out that, uh, from his agency he couldn't assure that that inventory is in fact comprehensive. Now only the White House could provide that assurance and in view of this, uh, do you believe the White House should have responsibility to maintain the inventory? What do you think? Well, the, the gifts come in the front door at the, at the White House or the back door or the side door, wherever it is, but they come to the White House. They're not sent to the archives. Uh, somebody's got to log the gifts someplace. Um, the, the beauty of an outright uh, ban uh, above a certain level is that you eliminate the logging process. Basically, you're saying if it's uh, above a certain level, it goes back, um, if it's a personal gift. Uh, but um, I don't see how you can transfer, well, I, I suppose you can technically, but um, Americans who want to give the president a gift send it to the White House. 
uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, whether you want to put those all in the back of a truck and take them down to um, uh, archives, I don't know. I mean, th this problem is not unique to the to the White House. I mean, every public official has to have some system by which he or she does screening and reviewing of of uh, of gifts in a variety of ways. If none of it comes at you like it comes to the White House, obviously, but. I think the reason it comes at that level is because people are giving those gifts. I hope they're giving those gifts not to get favor or curry favor or to get influence and access, but they're giving them a sort of a tribute. It seems to me that that therefore you want to have at every entry point an inventory method, but you need to get it to some centralized a place that it can be reviewed. So, I mean, the White House clearly is going to continue to have to play functions. The White House Council is going to have to play major function under any system. Uh, it seems to me. I think, but. Having some clarity as to what is expected is crucial. Mr. Walden, on your testimony, spells out a series of internal controls that the White House should adopt to improve the administration of presidential gifts. Would you favor legislation that simply requires the White House to institute and maintain these controls? Uh, not at this time. Uh, I think that there is, should be a very compelling showing before Congress legislates the internal operation of the Executive Office of the President. And although there, the record is replete with, with errors and mistakes made by the prior administration, I don't believe there is enough of a predicate, factual predicate, to demonstrate that this White House should be saddled with a legislative requirement that those reforms be done. However, I think Congress does have enough oversight authority uh, to ensure that the White House uh, does those uh, reforms. You uh, also state that accountability problems over the presidential gifts stem in part from the lack of public disclosure and transparency, yet you also state that legislation on this subject should not compromise legitimate privacy interests of the first family. Uh, that's right. I think this is just the price uh, that uh, the, the public pays uh, to uh, respect, uh, to give the, the, the presidency just a modicum of privacy that otherwise is stripped from the, the uh, first family when uh, upon election. Do you believe H.R. 1081 goes too far in making gift information available to the public? Uh, yes, I do. I don't know whether it was the intent of the, uh, of the bill to supersede FOIA, but the Freedom of Information Act has an exception from required disclosure for personnel, medical, or similar records, the disclosure of which would clearly constitute an invasion of personal privacy. That's uh, 5 U.S.C. 552 B6. And the 1081 does not have any such limitation on the public disclosure uh, of any gift information. Are there any other comments you'd like to make after you've heard your colleagues' comments? My heavens, lawyers there, and they don't want to go further? Fine. Well, here's my last question, Governor. Uh, I'm concerned about the ability of uh, researchers and others to gain access to copies of emails within the custody of the National Archives. Uh, is this a valid concern? Uh, you know, we had all these emails floating around. Uh, over the last two years, and I must say that uh, that gave me a good idea that I'll not have an email, and uh, because some of the silly things I saw floating around the previous administration, uh, it just seemed to me that it didn't help the president, and I don't think it helped the country. It was just sort of, uh, you know, a bunch of kids playing another bunch of kids. And I'm just curious uh, uh, is, uh, to what extent could the archives deal with that? And uh, I know we're putting a lot of things on you, but uh, in a new era, uh, if people are going to use emails uh, and uh, their government documents, uh, 
can the uh, archives handle it? Well, I, I think we have little or no choice because email, uh, those are records. Uh, the, the, the format, the medium does not determine whether they're a record, whether it's on paper, parchment, or electronic. So our responsibility is to deal with them as records, uh, treat them as we would regardless of the format. Obviously, with the technology issue involved, it does make things very complex, as we learned from uh, the last administration, where we were dealing with 40 million emails, um, and now the challenge of providing access to them, not to the public, because by law, the public at this point in the uh, time frame does not have access, but for uh, you folks in the courts, um, we are spending a lot of time and energy locating and finding the specific emails to which uh, there's been a request for. Uh, what procedures do you have now for providing copies? Can you, uh, if somebody under the uh, Freedom of Information law said, gee, I'd like to see the uh, uh, particular either uh, uh, personnel, presidential personnel, I don't know if that's open, uh, but uh, what are there the rules for who can get access to emails that are in the custody of the archives? And they'd be governed by the Presidential Records Act like any other uh, record. Uh, and so it would depend upon whether we're in the first five years, first 12 years, and all the exceptions that uh, have been a discussion point with uh, this committee as it relates to the act itself. Well, uh, this deserves, obviously, uh, further t uh, time uh, than we have this morning. And, uh, but uh, I just wanted to see that because we're in a technological age and uh, we need to handle it it's just like, as you said, all the other things uh, that uh, people have written over the years. Mr. Chairman, I'd take this opportunity to point out that the even greater challenge for us at the archives is to be able to preserve these digital records over time, uh, several generations of technology later, and be able to produce electronically an authentic record. Uh, that is the huge challenge that we're working with partners around the entire world to try to deal with. And we have confidence in the next few years we'll be able to develop that capacity so that uh, 50 or 100 years from now that digital record can be pulled up authentically on a much later generation of technology. And will you still have uh, space for the uh, gifts of the White House? <laughs> well, <laughs> or is we'll, that pushing it out? We uh, space is an issue with gifts, yeah. and there are a lot of uh, complicated issues involved, not just the ones uh, uh, discussed here this morning. Well, I thank you for coming, and I thank uh, the staff that's put this together. Uh, Russell George, our staff director and chief counsel right behind me. Uh, Bonnie Hill, the deputy staff director next to him. Uh, Henry Ray, right to my left, your uh, uh, right, and uh, he's the senior counsel for this session. And uh, majority clerk is Justin Polymus. Uh, Chris Barkley is a member of the subcommittee staff. Uh, Michael Sezanoff, same intern. Uh, Sterling Bentley, intern. Uh, Freddie Ephraim, intern. Uh, Joe DeSalvo, intern. The minority staff, Michelle Ash, professional staff. Uh, Early Green, minority clerk. And other staffs were Barbara Kalo, <coughs> Deputy Staff Director for Mr. Rossi's Subcommittee on Energy Policy and Natural Resources and Regulatory Affairs. And we thank the uh, court reporters, Mark Stewart and Desiree uh, Yura. And uh, we thank you for all your hard work. And with that, we are adjourned.
Thank <laughs> you. 